Good morning, everybody. I will just do this. Um, our first session this morning is entitled Alternative Prep and Treatment. I think Gossip should probably say alternatives to oral prep and treatment. Uh, the deliveries, the drugs, the formulations, and the long-term solutions. And our first presenter from uh, the Saint Louis Hospital in Paris is Sylvain Chocqui. C'est correct? Chocqui, pardon. Chocqui, um, who's a PhD student working with the Avenir trial in Paris. And he is going to talk to us about the different questions that are coming up, the as-needed prep, the uh, different body compartments, the rectum, the anus, the penis, all these factors that go into research and that we need to bear in mind doing research. Sylvain. Thank you all for being there. I'm very uh, excited to be given the opportunity to talk to you today about um, PrEP. And we are going to be interested more on some groups of population, which are cis and trans women and trans men. Um, why do we focus on those groups? Uh, because they are a high risk population for HIV with more than half of people living with HIV being represented by women um, in studies. Uh, transgender women have a 49-fold risk of uh, HIV acquisition compared to other adults. And um, AIDS-related illness is the second leading cause of death in young women in Africa. Part of that uh, can be explained by the high-risk uh, sex acts that are receptive anal intercourse and receptive vaginal intercourse that are more prevalent in this uh, population. And if we want to understand that, we have to look at the different genital compartments and in terms of number of layer of cells, in terms of kind of molecules that are present in the genital fluids, in the microbiota, the presence of certain type of cells, and especially immunological cells that are the target for the virus. We are also going to talk a little bit of the effects of hormones. So this is a representation simplified of the rectal mucosa with one layer of cells and directly underneath the target cells for the HIV, which are immunological cells. If we are looking at the vaginal and cervical tissue, it's very different with multiple layer of cells and that can explain some differences in the transmission. When we're looking at that representation, we also see what happens after the virus has gone through that first barrier. It goes to the lymph node where it can proliferate and then disseminate to the rest of the body. And at the moment, in PrEP, we don't know exactly where the PrEP efficacy takes place. Is it at the first step here in the lymph node or after or a combination of those compartments or all of those compartments? At the moment, we don't have a clear answer. Uh, I just wanted to show you here in the rectal mucosa these kind of cells that are dendritic cells, they're immunological cells, and they can do something. They act as a Trojan horse for the virus with some, sorry, some cytoplasmic expansion that can go inside the lumen of the rectum, catch the virus, and make it go through the first barrier in that way. Um, I don't think I'll have time to talk about the penile uh, tissue, which is not really of the most interest in, uh, in our uh, topic today. When we are looking at hormones, First, the thing uh, that has been shown is that contraceptive for women, uh, for cis women, um, can enhance the number of target cells for HIV inside the cervical tissue, which could lead to a um, facilitation of HIV transmission. But we can also look at the differences between um, and the, the interaction between the PrEP 
agents and the hormones that are used in contraception. And most of the study uh, that has looked at that don't show um, a negative effect of the, the contraception. In, here in vitro, we can see that there is no uh, negative effect of uh, using contraception on PrEP pharmacology. And this has also been done in in vivo in cis women taking PrEP and contraception. And those are the, um, the level of t tenofovir in the tissue. And there is no significant uh, difference. When we're looking at feminizing hormone for uh, transgender women, there are some studies that show, this study was done in 22 um, transgender women in Thailand. It shows a slight lower uh, level of tenofovir in the blood of the women taking feminizing hormone. But this difference is so slight that it shouldn't be any concern on the PrEP effectiveness. But I'm just here to tell you to bear that in mind when we're doing this kind of study. Oh, this is a study that I really like. <laughs> it uh, shows how the vaginal microbiote can actually interact with uh, the PrEP. In this study, they used tenofovir uh, gel, and they showed that some types of vaginal microbiome was associated to a higher risk of HIV infection, and especially in the presence of Gardnerella vaginalis, I'm sorry for the Russian translator there. Uh, Gardnerella vaginalis can um, actually metabolize tenofovir and making it less available for the tissue. So that's something that we really have to bear in mind when we're doing some studies on gels in, uh, in vaginal intercourse. So now I'm going to talk about what has been done and what will maybe be the future in some of those uh, population groups. And we are going to start with cis women. So I was talking about gels, and the first study of, uh, on gel was a event-driven use of a tenofovir gel and showed efficacy around 40% in that study in, in South Africa. And if you look at the group that was the most adherent, it was even a little higher. So that was very promising, but unfortunately, when it was replicated with more patients, we saw no effectiveness this time. But we have to know that the adherence was really low. Another study with the gel was voice study. It was this time daily use of a tenofovir gel, and again, no uh, significant impact of the gel, but again, low adherence. So we see that the adherence is really important, and so can, what can we do in topical PrEP? What has been done already is use a vaginal ring that can be self-inserted and that will deliver the drug, which is in this uh, case is tapivirin. And it has been shown to be effective from 30 to almost 40% in two uh, studies in women in various sub-Saharan African countries. So this is the ring study and also in the Aspire study. And those two studies have had their own follow-up study, um, open labeled with all the women uh, being proposed to keep going on with the, the drug. And it shows a sustained um, reduction in HIV incidence uh, compared to what was expected without PrEP. So this is the HOPE study and there's also the DREAM study. So I'm going to talk a little bit of systemic PrEP and just before I'm talking about the clinical studies and something that I think should be interesting to keep in mind is that when we are looking at the tissue, the compartment tissue, we can see differences in how the drug um, interact with the tissue. 24 or 48 hours after taking one pill of Truvada, we can see high level of tenofovir in the rectal tissue, but low levels in the cervical tissue, whereas it's the other way around for the emtricitabine. 
So this is a logarithmic scale, so the difference here are actually quite high. So just something, we don't really know what the, the impact, what, what kind of impact that can have, but we have to bear that in mind. So this was one of the studies that was done in women with uh, PrEP as um, pills also, TDF, TDF, FTC, and showed no differences. But in this study, as I said before, the adherence was really low. And we have another study when we can say basically the same thing, again in Africa, with women having daily oral TDF, FTC, or placebo, and we don't see any difference. But again, very low adherence. But even with all this data, we don't have to say no uh, to these drugs, to those drugs for women, because we have other studies that can show us that with a higher adherence, we can have an effect. In the partners PrEP study, women in zero discordant couples uh, in Africa were more adherent to the treatment, which can be easily understood when your partner is known to be a person living with HIV. And this time we saw a significant reduction of HIV with tenofovir uh, or tenofovir and tricitabine daily, both in the randomized control trial and in the second phase of open uh, labeled. Kind of the same thing can be said for another study in intravenous drug user. If we look at the subgroup of uh, heterosexual cis women inside those intravenous drug user, again, the use of daily TDF was associated with a reduced risk of HIV acquisition. And some of the same things could be said for the TDF2 study. Um, if you're looking at the subgroup of persons that are really adherent to the treatment. So um, after TDFFTC, what's, what is ongoing at the moment? We have some hope for a TAF or a TAF FTC with here no, uh, at the moment, clinical studies in cis women, but we have some preclinical studies. Here are, uh, this is a model of macaques that are exposed vaginally to a SHIV virus, which is a combination of an HIV and a, a Simian virus. And we showed in that study, I mean, they showed in that stu uh, study that the use of FTC TAF was associated with a really, really low risk of HIV infection, SHIV infection. Another study that is ongoing in uh, macaques also is an insert of TAF combined with uh, eviltegravir. And this shows, again, a really high level uh, of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it shows a really important reduction in the uh, SHIV risk. And also really high, high levels of drugs in the tissue. But as I said, we don't have studies in uh, cis women at the moment with uh, TAF. There is a study that I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later uh, with transgender women and cisgender MSM. Um, so at the moment, the TAF FTC indications are excluding vaginal receptive integrals. But we have some preclinical data that are uh, giving us some hope for that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the reprivirine long-acting because it has been discontinued by, uh, by the pharmaceutical company. So if we have time, we can talk about it better. So we have another injectable new drug, which is the cabotegravir that can be um, theoretized, theoretized for uh, PrEP. And it has been shown in the same kind of macaque model with HIV, SHIV vaginal challenge that it was really effective in preventing the uh, SHIV infection in the macaque. When we are looking at humans this time, we see that with intermittent injections, we have high levels of the drug in the, in the blood which uh, would be a good candidate for a PrEP agent that would be used only once a month or once every two months. 
And um, interestingly enough, the, the level of drugs were more sustained and more stable in cis women than in cis men in this study. So there is an ongoing study at the moment of TAF, uh, of, sorry, of uh, long-acting cabotegravir compared to uh, TDFFTC in cis women in Africa with the goal of more than 3,000 women uh, to be included in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this study is really interesting because this is a superiority study. Most of the studies uh, comparing to TDFFTC are non-inferiority, but this one is a superiority study. And it's interesting because if we have a better adherence with the treatment that is injectable, we can expect a better effectiveness, and this study is really designed to show that. There are ongoing studies as well with new drugs, with new mechanism of, uh, of effect, uh, with new, uh, yeah, new mechanism of effect on the reverse transcriptors like eslatravir. At the moment, it's just a um, pharmacokinetic kin kinetics uh, study um, with the oral pill, but there are some cis women that are um, included, so we might have some uh, data in the tissue in the women in the future with that drug. Another way to get that drug is through an implant, and this is really interesting for us because this implant showed that we can have high level and stable level of the drug with the implant, so making it a very interesting uh, candidate for a PrEP agent. If we look at trans women now, I want to speak a little bit of what has been done first with the TDFFTC. There was this study, IPREX, who uh, looked at the efficacy of TDFFTC um, compared to placebo in cis men having sex with men and transgender women. And when we are looking at the subgroup analysis of the transgender women, we can see something that was quite uh, distressing at first, which is that there is no reduction of HIV infection in this subgroup of uh, participants. But if we are looking further, we can see that all the transgender women that had a level um, of drug that can be detected in the blood, they had no infection. So the key component here was again adherence. If people are not taking the PrEP, uh, the, the efficacy, the effectiveness uh, is much lower. And the other thing that was interesting in that study is that uh, a higher risk exposure was also associated with a higher risk of not taking PrEP, meaning that they are not protected at the most at-risk moment. Also, we can see in this study that there was no impact of the feminizing hormone therapy on, on the drug level, which is uh, really interesting for us. So I was talking about this study discover of TEF-FTC compared in the non-inferiority uh, model to uh, TDF-FTC. And 1% of the participants were transgender women. And in this subgroup, there was no HIV infection. So this is not a very strong level of evidence, but this is, again, evidence that TDF-FTC and TEF-FTC are a good candidate for all populations especially this population as well. So I talked to you about the long-acting cabotegravir in the vaginal macaque challenge, but if we're speaking about transgender women, we have to acknowledge that they have a higher risk of condomless receptive anal intercourse. So we have to look as well at the rectal um, uh, possibility of infection. And it has been done that the same uh, team that did the first study I, I showed you, they did a rectal SHIV exposure in, in macaques, and they showed that with the cabotegravir, we have a really uh, high protection with that treatment. This leads to an ongoing study in um, cisgender uh, MSM and transgender women of LA cabotrigravir compared to TDFFTC. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a non-inferiority um, study. And what's interesting is that they have a goal of 
including at least 10% of transgender women. And I think this is something that should be done more in the new studies, uh, putting goals of at least a number of mm, transgender women, transgender men, because as you can see, uh, there is not a lot of data. Especially in transgender men, it was already said yesterday, and I'm not going to dwell too much on that because I don't have a lot of scientific data to show you today, but we can show something that's really important is that we have a gap here. Um, transgender men are at a higher risk of HIV as well, especially when they engage in condomless anal uh, intercourse or condomless vaginal intercourse that was already said yesterday. And among transgender men, the PrEP awareness is really low. So we have to do something, we have to do something and uh, especially include more of this population in our studies. So in conclusion, we have a proven efficacy of the oral TDF FTC for all population at the moment. We have a sufficient uh, proof enough that this works. But what is really important is the adherence to the drug. And so what can we do to increase the adherence, especially in those groups of population that are at higher risk? We can modify the drug. We can modify the way that we administrate it. The vaginal rings for that in women in Africa are um, very promising, the, the injectable uh, drugs are also very promising. And again, we don't have specific data on transgender men and we need more data in this population to be able to make good recommendation. I would like to thank uh, the whole clinical team that is working in the prep clinic with us and the community peers especially at AIDS, who are with us every day. And a special thank to Jean-Michel Molina, who helped me put together these slides. Thank you.